Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's hallelujah. Amen. Good to see all of you this morning. Hope you had a good week. I know mine went very, very fast, uh, which is I was talking with uh, Jim Vincent beforehand. That's, I guess that's better than going slow. So, But I hope our time together is uplifting to your spirit today as we are worshiping God together and as we're in fellowship with one another. I do have some uh, quick announcements uh, to, to talk about this morning. Um, if you could sign the red welcome folder so that we know that you're here, that would be great. Uh, they're at the end of your pews. Today we're collecting a special offering. Uh, it's the one great hour of sharing offering. Uh, this is a special offering that the UCC collects around uh, the first part of spring in the Lenten time. Uh, it goes to many missions across the United Church of Christ and other Christian denominations. Uh, we are not the only denomination that collects one great hour of sharing. Uh, the emphasis this year goes to help uh, hunger, help fight against hunger. Uh, so many of the resources collected this year will go towards food banks, soup kitchens, uh, feeding those both uh, here in the U.S. as well as internationally. Uh, and so we have special envelopes in the back on the table if you feel led and uh, have some extra resources to give. That would be great. We'll uh, put that in the offering plate. And uh, the insert today gives a little bit of uh, a, a breakdown, a story of someone who has uh, benefited from the One Great Hour of Sharing offering and a little bit of the, uh, the theme of this year and where it goes. Uh, Today, after this service, the Women's Association will gather to stuff eggs for the Easter egg hunt. Uh, so all the ladies who uh, agreed to be a part of that, make sure you uh, get together, I think, with Kathleen in the back. I don't know. Are you going to be upstairs or downstairs? Upstairs. Okay. Uh, so, make sure, uh, so we can get ready for that because Easter's are coming very, very quick. And speaking of Easter, uh, the cookie orders uh, that Sarah Circle is doing uh, the order forms are out in the commons. They are due next week. And also the Easter flowers, if you would like to buy Easter flowers to uh, decorate the sanctuary for Easter in honor or in memory of someone, those are also due next week. All right, Susie, do you have any announcements? Good morning. It's so nice to see everybody this morning. I do have two announcements. One is that um, all the kids of the church are invited to an ice skating party this afternoon at 2.30 at um, Moylan Iceplex out on 125th in Maple. If you are going to come or bring guests, please let me know so we just have an idea how many numbers, how many kids are coming. And also, um, the Easter egg hunt is coming on April 8th. If you know of any kids that would love to come and find eggs and do some other Easter activities, please send them our way. It starts at 9.30. Thank you. All right, thank you. I have a question. Uh, with so many eggs today, does that mean you don't want any more candy and items after today? You can always use more candy and more items. The more, the merrier. All right. Thank you, Susie. Any other announcements for the good of the fellowship? Kathy. All right. Uh, so if, any, if you didn't catch that next week, well, uh, so this week we're putting together the Easter eggs. Next week we'll put together the Easter baskets. Like I said, Easter is coming up very, very fast. Any other announcements? Well, if there are none, uh, would you please rise as you are able and let us greet one another in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. I forgot, bad on me, I did have one more announcement, kind of. It is uh, not every day that we get to celebrate an anniversary, and so we're, we were going to point out, I see the blush already on their faces, uh, Dwayne and Lori Solonen's anniversary is today, and so the altar flowers are on, uh, are in celebration of their anniversary. 
Well, it's good that you remembered before the day was, was, before the day was done. So congratulations, and, and um, we wish and pray for many more uh, years ahead for you. Well, let us begin with our choral uh, uh, call to worship this morning, the next verse, the fourth verse of, again, we keep this solemn fast, and then we move into our opening song of praise, Lift High the Cross. Please be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty God, we confess, we confess before, before you, you 
that and we have hungered after, after that which, which does not satisfy. We have, we have disobeyed your commands. We, we have, have doubted your power to protect us. us. Forgive, Forgive our lack of faith and, and have mercy on us. Restore us so that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O people of God, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love and full redemption. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, I love it. Look at all these kids up here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, who has been on spring break this week? A lot of you? Some of you, anyhow. I know some of OPS was out this week. So, I have to introduce you to someone. This is Peyton. Oh, yeah. When I was little, Peyton was my best friend. She had all the cool toys. She had all the cool clothes. We had lots of fun together, and I would spend a lot of time at her house. And she even had a playhouse in her backyard. So we loved playing over there. But she didn't go to the same school as I did. And so when she had her school friends over, I wasn't invited. In fact, I thought I was her best friend, but she had a birthday party and invited all her school friends, but I was not invited. So I thought she was my best friend. So this is another friend that I had. She lived down the street from me, like four houses down. And she, she looks pretty worried. Well, she didn't have all the cool clothes. In fact, she, she wore hand-me-downs from her sisters, and she only had one doll, and she had nasty hair, the doll did. So, but when I wasn't allowed to play with Ale or Peyton, I got to play with Elena, and we had lots of fun because they had a garden that we could pick rhubarb, and I loved eating raw rhubarb and sour apples because they had an apple tree and they had a creek running down their house when it rained we would play in there so i had a lot of fun with her too but elena was not allowed to play with peyton because peyton's parents wouldn't allow that because they thought that she was because she didn't have the right clothes and didn't look like them and didn't have food on the table all the time that she wasn't worth being a friend. So I really liked playing with Elena because we had lots of fun and I loved being outside, but I also liked playing with my best friend, who I thought was my best friend, because she had all the cool stuff. Which one do you think would be the better friend? Uh, Peyton. 
Peyton, Elena. Uh, Peyton. Peyton, why? Why Peyton? Because that's the name of my cousin. Oh, okay. Why? Why are you saying Elena? Because she treats me a lot. Treated me a lot better. What else? She was a true friend, yeah, because she was always my friend, not just when her other friends weren't around. So just because Elena looked different than Peyton, Peyton wasn't allowed to play. They weren't allowed to play together, so we, the three of us could never play together because Peyton wasn't allowed to play with Elena. But I kind of think, I agree with you guys, that Elena, I had more fun with her, and it wasn't like, oh, well, Peyton's got her school friends over, so I can't play with her. You know, I could always play with Elena because really Elena didn't have a lot of friends because a lot of people thought that she didn't look like them. Her skin was darker and she wore hand-me-downs and didn't have all the cool stuff. But really, Elena was the better friend. Which reminds me, when we're in school and we see somebody different than us, that maybe doesn't look like us or have all the cool things or the cool toys or the latest shoes or whatever, that really doesn't matter. God calls to love everybody, everybody, not just the ones with the, not just the cool kids. He wants us to love everybody because God loved everybody. So we have to remember that, that it's not just certain people, people that look exactly like us. It's everybody that we have to love. So today, um, downstairs for Sunday school, we're going to do a mission project, and we're going to fill Easter eggs for the Easter egg hunt. And one of the reasons we're doing that is to spread God's love or our love through God's love through us to people in our community, people that live around us and maybe people that don't live quite around us. They may not look like us. We don't know who's going to come. They may not look like us or act like us. But they're still God's people, and God, call, God calls us to love everyone. So we're going to fill Easter eggs so that we can spread God's love um, through our Easter egg hunt that's coming up. What is it actually? It's April 8th. It's on the Saturday before Easter. We're going to have lots of fun activities going on. <coughs> oh, yeah. So before we go downstairs to do our mission project, let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to remember that you want us to love our neighbors. Our neighbors are everybody. They may not look like us. They may not act like us. They may not have all the things that we have, but they are still our neighbors, and you want us to love everybody. Help us to love everybody regardless of what they look like. Help us to be kind to people and help other people out and to welcome people that don't look like us. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Yep. I'll grab it. That's what it's all about. Christians, this is your calling. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody sing and shout.
Thank you, choir. For our scripture reading today, we are continuing in Leviticus. This time we're in chapter 19. It's another long one. We're getting into some long chapters, but we're getting into some good stuff, I think. Uh, We're reading all 37 verses. If you're following along in one of the Pew Bibles, it is on page 85. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to us this morning. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect his mother and father and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you sacrifice a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the next day. Anything left over until the third day must be burned up. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is impure and will not be accepted. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because he has desecrated what is holy to the Lord. That person must be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over, do not go over to your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord, your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. If a man sleeps with a woman who is a slave girl promised to another man, but who has not been ransomed or given her freedom, there must be due punishment. Yet they are not to be put to death because she had not been freed. The man, however, must bring a ram to the entrance to the tent of meeting for a guilt offering to the Lord. With the ram of the guilt offering, the priest is to make atonement for him before the Lord for the sin he has committed, and his sin will be forgiven. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord your God. Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it. Do not practice divination or sorcery. Do not cut the hair on the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and be filled with wickedness. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. 
The alien living with you must be treated as one of your na native born. Love him as yourself, for you were once aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hymn. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. I am the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Love. Love is one of the most talked about things among us human beings. So many songs have been sung about love, from Elvis Presley to Elton John to Whitney Houston. Love transcends media. Many books have been written about love. So many movies have been produced about love. So many sermons have been preached about love. We talk all about love. God is love. We are to love. Love, love, love. We've talked so much about love. What more is there to say? Well, I'm going to try. Our text from Leviticus 19 is an interesting mix of diverse laws. Some of them that seem pretty straightforward, some that are a little bit strange to us, some which echo the principles of most of the Ten Commandments, some that cover proper ritual procedures like the sacrifices, and others that cover proper social interactions. As you were reading this, I imagine you were wondering, okay, what's the through line of all of this? Well, the unifying point of this chapter is found in verse 2. God's people are to mirror God's holiness. The exact center of this chapter is verse 18, which I believe acts as this chapter's thesis statement, in which God says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but... Love your neighbor as yourself. The words of verse 18 reverberate not only through, the rest, through this entire chapter, but through the entirety of Scripture. And it is here in which God lays the foundation of every human relationship. Love. Not power. Not greed. Not a self-serving desire to have a good image. Not even self-preservation or self-survival. But love. Yet the framework of this chapter, and much of the entire book of Leviticus, is holiness. So how do the two connect? Well, the chapter begins with the echo back to God's command which actually we read last week in chapter 11, verses 44 through 45, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. But how can us faulty human beings become holy as God is holy? A challenge which the apostle Peter also applies to Christians in, her, in his first letter. Well, I think to begin with, we must acknowledge the lone source of holiness, who is God, who is intrinsically holy. Any holiness that we are able to do or give it ultimately finds its source only in God. But God's, and God's holiness is shared with us through our special connection with him, which is established and maintained in our faith, in our faith, in our lives, in our living of separate lives that are given to him. The same has, it's always been that way. The priests, the objects that were used, or the space that was used in the Israelite worship system, they were considered holy because they were set apart for God. They were only to be used in God's worship. And in the same way, the Israelites themselves 
were holy because they entered into a special relationship, which we call covenant, with God. And through that special relationship with God, God delivered them and thus separated them from Egypt. And they were his. They were God's. Now, I think we get the overall concept. Holiness is a separation, a uniqueness, a dedication to God. But, but what does holiness look like? Well, again, holiness is what God is. And if we are to be holy, we must reflect what God is. And by extension, do what God does. Now, obviously, that does not mean that we have all of God's mysterious and tremendous glory and power. We cannot miraculously make something exist, although that would be really cool if we could do that. But that's not what it means that we share in God's holiness. Leviticus 19 tells us what human beings must do to reflect God's holiness. We are to mirror God's active, righteous, and just character in a way that we live our lives within the framework of our relationships. God's holy character is revealed through what he did for humanity. The entirety of this book we call the Bible reveals God's holiness through his actions, through what he did for the world. And so we as human beings then become holy by reflecting God's characters and actions. And what does God constantly do throughout Scripture? What does he do over and over and over and over? Sometimes why, but, but he does it again and again. He loves he loves you. He loves me. And so we become more holy. We reflect more of God's character as we grow in love. But what is love? Anybody get that? Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. This is, this is the nerd in me. So this is, this is Hathaway. It was the 90s song, What is love? Baby, don't hurt. Anyway. <laughs> I, I'm a big nerd, I know. When I, when I wrote that, I'm like, what is love? I'm like, baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm crazy, I get it. <clears throat> anyway, what is love? Well, I think love has taken on a wide variety of meanings in our modern culture. Love often takes the form of, of a feeling of affection for someone or something. Uh, but often, I think, when we talk about love in that way, it's kind of a, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a feeling that doesn't always last. Many times have I heard someone who dates someone, especially if they are a really attractive person and they're drooling all over them and they say, oh, we're so in love. And uh, sometimes I can't help but think there's, there's maybe some love there, but maybe there's maybe some lust there too, but I don't know. But we, we talk about love as a feeling that, you know, we, we love and appreciate our pets or we love our family or we love ourselves or we love something. I think in some forms, our modern, in our modern world, love kind of takes a self, uh, it's kind of self-defined. We, it's whatever we feel at the moment. But God's kind of love is characterized by justice and unselfish kindness. God's kind of love is putting another's interests equal to your own. It's a love, it's a, a, a kindness, a, 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 a something that goes above and beyond what is required of us. In Scripture, love is more than just a feeling. It is a, it, it's a principle. 
In Leviticus 19.18, God tells us to love our neighbor. Love is a verb, which, yes, includes affection, includes feelings. But the fact that God can command his people to love shows, I think, that love is something more. It's something that we can choose to do rather than something we passively fall into. We've always heard of falling into love. But the kind of love that God talks about here is is something more. But why is love so crucial? I think that's been the question that we as humans have attempted to answer ever since the dawn of history. We know that love is important, but we struggle with putting it into words. True, unselfish, godly love, I think, is the only basis on which we human beings can peacefully coexist with one another. We can create laws. We can enforce those laws. But I think even law has to have some kind of foundation on which it can stand. Otherwise, they kind of become meaningless regulations that we may or may not want to follow. And as Christians, we we believe that that foundation is love. Unfortunately, we human beings have become so far removed from the true source of love that We have such a hard time grasping what it means, what it is without God's help. We need the example of Christ, the influence of the Holy Spirit, the witness of natural creation, the entire Bible itself to teach us what love is. As I said before, love is not just a feeling. We are required to love our neighbors. Have any of you ever struggled to love a neighbor? You've just had a neighbor or someone in your life that no matter what you do, you cannot find love for. I think we all have in some form. No matter how much you dig deep into your heart, you dig deep into yourself, you you just can't find that love no matter how hard hard you try. I think sometimes loving another can be really easy for us. And other times it is almost unnatural. And I think in order for us to love those who we have such a hard time, almost an unnatural ability to uh, to love, we need to find that love from an outside source, something outside of ourselves. And that source is God himself who is love and who offers it freely to those who ask. We then take God's love that he gives to us and then gives it, give it away to others. But why do we struggle so much with it? I think a large problem ends up being our desire for control, our desire for self-reliance, We want to be like Frank Sinatra and do it our way. However, Scripture tells us many times of many people who said yes to God that allow ourselves to be open to be filling with God's love and then share it with others. And the more we receive that love, from God, the more we emulate his holy character. Those who mirror God's holy and loving character fulfill what is talked about in this chapter. We don't only just say our prayers, we don't only just come to worship. Those who reflect God's holy and loving character honor their parents, as it says in verse 3. They help the poor and the alien among them as it says in verses 9 and 10 and 33 and 34. They are honest, as it says in 11 through 13 and 35 and 36. They treat physically challenged individuals with respect, as it says in verses 14 and 32. 
They abstain from malicious gossip, as it says in verse 16. They do not hate or hold a grudge against one another, as in verses 17 and 18. They feed the hungry, they give drink to the thirsty, they welcome the stranger, they clothe the naked, they care for the sick, and they visit those in prison, as Jesus said in Matthew 25. That's all good, and maybe we do some of that, but then we struggle with the question, well, who is my neighbor? Leviticus 19.18 commands us to love our neighbor, but who exactly is that? In the context of this chapter, the word neighbor means one of your people, that meaning a fellow Israelite. But one time there was somebody who challenged that interpretation. A legal expert asked Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Luke, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told the famous story about a man who was robbed and beaten, and a priest and a Levite, and a compassionate Samaritan. And then Jesus posed a question back to the, to, the, to the lawyer, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And of course, the lawyer, not comfortable with saying the Samaritan because the Samaritan was, the, was his enemy, the lawyer responded, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. Jesus extended the law of love beyond the boundaries of just our people, which we could take and classify in many different ways, whether it's just our family and friends, or maybe it's just our church people, or maybe it's just the people of our country. Jesus extended those boundaries, not even extended them, he wiped them out and made, who is my neighbor? And answered it, anybody. Maybe even someone we consider an enemy. The story of the Good Samaritan connects with this passage in Leviticus to remind us that that opportunities for us to show compassion, to show love, are tests for us and help us indicate whether or not we are living as God's holy people. As people of God, we are called by God to be holy as God is holy. And to live as holy people means that we love our neighbor as ourself. So what do we have to say about love? Well, love is our banner. Love is our way of life. Love is our law. Love is who we are. Because as it says here in Leviticus 19, and as Jesus said in in, in the Gospel Gospel of Luke chapter 10, love is holiness. Amen. For our pastoral prayer today, I have a special prayer uh, I want to give a little bit of background to. Uh, I, uh, if, you are on, uh, if you're uh, following the church's Facebook page, I, I uh, shared a little bit of this on Friday. Friday was a, a special day called St. Patrick's Day. And uh, one of the, there's a prayer called St. Patrick's Breastplate Prayer uh, that I just, I I love. It is so beautiful and wonderful. Um, It is attributed to St. Patrick. Uh, We assume it was written by him. But the prayer for today, I'd like, it kind of um, takes a part of that. It expands a little bit. But uh, I just thought I'd let you know that this is based on St. Patrick's breastplate prayer. So let us pray. O Creator God, At the beginning of time, you created all things and called them good. The virtues of the starlit heaven, the glorious sun's life-giving ray, the whiteness of the moon at even, the flashing of the lightning free, 
the whirling winds, tempestuous shocks, the stable earth, the deep salt sea around the old eternal rocks. O Redeemer God, when the time was right, you granted us Christ's incarnation, his baptism in the Jordan River, his death on the cross for our salvation, his bursting from the spiced tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming at the day of doom. O sustainer God, grant us your power to hold and lead, your eye to watch, your might to stay, your ear to hearken to our need, your ancient wisdom to teach, your hand to guide, your shield to ward, the true and timeless word to give us speech, your heavenly host to be our guard. O Christ, be with us, Christ within us, Christ behind us, Christ before us, Christ beside us, Christ to win us, Christ to comfort and restore us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love us, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. We pray this prayer in the strong name of the Trinity, the three in one, the one in three, of whom all nature hath creation. Eternal Father, Spirit, Word. Praise be to the God of our salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. In response to your giving today, both to the work of uh, Northwest Hills Church, as well as to the work of the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church across the world, would you please rise as you are able and let us join together in our doxology. Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. O oh God, oh God, take, take our, our gifts, gifts and use them for the healing of your world. May your, your cup of love overflow and abide with the hungry, the hurting, and the heartbroken, so that we all may be made holy in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn, Lavish Love, Abundant Beauty.
quick reminder that Women's Association is meeting to stuff eggs, so make sure you do that if you're a part of that group. We have met today, we have come together in fellowship and have been united with the spirit of Christ in worship. As you go forth this day, may you go, and in everything you do, love your neighbor as yourself. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you do it. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. <laughs>